My name is Susan Harden and I am on the uh, UDL IRN Board of Directors and also I'm a, a UDL coordinator in Macomb County, Michigan and we're glad to have you here tonight. So I think you're in for a really great night of learning. We're excited, we're excited about the topic. Excited. Oh, Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm in the broadcast too on my computer. So we're excited about the topic. And tonight's panelists, we have uh, Dr. David or Doc Dockerman, and he is a lecturer at uh, Harvard Graduate School of Education. Uh, and also we have Sandra Earle. Um, she is from Inclusive Design Product Manager for Brightspace, or D2L, and our own very own Steve Nordmark, who is our UDL IRN COO, and also is Technical Assistance Specialist for the AIM Center in um, uh, Forecast. So we're glad to have you all here tonight, and we're excited to hear more about the topic. So Steve, if you wanna take us to the next slide. Our Twitter uh, and moderator chats this evening are from our UDL IRN professional learning community, uh, Brian Dean and Corinne Hauer. So they'll be uh, watching for your questions tonight and passing those on to our panelists. So the way tonight's panel will work is we're gonna use the 2020-20 protocol. Uh, we're gonna use it quite loosely, so it'll be sort of um, as needed we'll adjust the time allotment but the basic structure of the evening is that the first 20 minutes or the first third of the webinar we'll be talking about the problem around ed technology and um, whether or not it supports universal design for learning the second third or 20 minutes of the webinar, we'll be talking about some potential solutions to that problem outlined. And then the last 20 minutes, you'll have a chance to ask the panelists questions, uh, get your ideas out there, solicit information from uh, our crew tonight. So sit back and enjoy. Uh, make sure you're thinking about questions and sharing your ideas, uh, whether it's via Twitter or in our chat or when we open it up to those questions along the way. So enjoy. Just one final reminder, our Twitter hashtag is UDLIRN. I'm gonna hit the mute button and send it back to Steve for our introduction to tonight's problem. Yeah, thanks Sue, I appreciate it. And excited to have this opportunity to be here with Doc and Sandra to talk about this topic. It's a technical working group that's part of a UDL credentialing and certification initiative, uh, CAST, and UDL IRN and then the uh, National uh, UDL Task Force have teamed up on this initiative. And one of the three key strands out of that initiative was trying to come up with some certification criteria for ed tech and curriculum product certification. So Doc, I think uh, you're gonna kick it off for us here. Well, I'll give it a shot. So in my, I have had a long life in uh, educational publishing, and it can almost be traced back to a program called Wiggleworks, which I, was one of the first UDL-based programs that came out of CAST. And then Thinking Reader was a program that also came out of CAST that uh, we published at Tom Snyder Productions and Scholastic. And those programs, products were definitely born in the UDL world and tried to represent uh, universal design principles in their development and, and in the manifestation of the program was what they were about. And in many, almost all of the other programs that I've been a part of, including Read 180, Math 180, lots of programs at Tom Snyder and at Scholastic, uh, were done in consultation with CAST. They, we tried, worked really hard to, to um, over the years, kind of inculcate UDL principles, not yet, UDL principles in the, uh, <clears throat> in the development team and what we were doing. Now, in none of these programs did you ever see a UDL stamp. And while universal design was an important part of what we were always trying to do, never really kind of, um, bubbled to the surface in terms of the brand of UDL and the validation of it. You could kind of read about it in the research foundations that we uh, made for them, but it never really got that 
like, how would you know? And did it matter? We thought it was important, but in terms of conveying that to the world, not so much. So these are products, there are products out there that are built on UDL principles that have been built with the UDL community. There are also products, Steve, the next slide, that um, created by people who have no clue of UDL, um, but have some really great UDL elements in them. This is a, a snapshot from a, a graphing tool called Desmos, which is very cool. And the, the folks at Desmos just want to do good stuff. Uh, Eli Lubroff, who's the founder of Desmos, one of his programmers is blind. And uh, the way Eli tells the story, he was um, in a, in a uh, video call, as such as it is with this programmer, and Eli says, the programmer, I, 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 you're not coming through. And the programmer says, let me check. And he says, no, it's working. And he goes, oh, wait, let me turn the lights on. Because of course the programmer is working in the dark. He had, didn't need to have the lights on for him. Turns the lights on and it's just, okay. He's got a way to program, but the blind programmer doesn't have a way to actually use the graphing program. And he wants to. So one of the things that he does is like he has to figure out a way to do that. So he makes it so that the graph, you can have it play a tune as it runs through the graph and it changes tone as it moves and it changes tone. You hear a noise when it crosses the X or Y axis and, and it changes from positive to negative and you can have it say each point along the way. So he was developing these wonderful UDL features and Lee, Eli was pre presenting this at a conference and I went up to Eli after him afterwards and I know Eli, I said, Eli, do you know anything about UDL? This is so cool, he goes, never heard of it. And so I immediately connected him with David Rose and they got talking right away. But this is the kind of thing, it's like there's stuff happening in bits and pieces and, and wouldn't it be nice if we could actually do it intentionally? So next slide, uh, Steve. Wouldn't it be nice to, to know what's really universally designed? There are things out there that may claim it. Do they really do it? There are things that are doing it. Do you know they're doing it? There are people who are trying to do the right thing, but maybe not um, as informed about the, the principles that have been well thought out through the uh, work of the UDL community. And so we wanted to take this on to, um, you know, promote more universally designed products to provide guidance to those who want to do this on how you really do it. How do you make universally designed products? And to reward and acknowledge ongoing improvements in, uh, in meeting this great need. There's, there's a lot of diversity and variability among our students. What can we do? And that was part of our charge in, in trying to bring coherence and depth to a lot of things that were already going on. So I'll turn it to you, Steve, to- Yeah, thanks, Doc. And this is a similar slide, uh, just kind of transitioning subtly over to the context of the initiative overall, right? So within the initiative, what was driving us, similar to what Doc was just saying is, how do you know it when you see it, right? What does it look like? Uh, you know, whose perspective is valid? And how do you verify the product? So. We took that within a technical working group that was assembled. And the best part about that working group was we had folks, uh, you know, like Doc, like Sandra, who had a wide variety of experience in product development, both curricular product development, as well as, you know, even designing accessibility tools. Uh, folks who worked in assessment, folks who worked in uh, you know, hardcore curriculum products, folks who work like Sandra on learning management systems that serve a variety of different curricular needs. And then we even had the advantage of having a couple of folks on the team who were from the practitioner side. So they were from the school districts who would be consumers of these products. So it was invaluable as we went through that. And from an objective standpoint, we want to make sure that we established these criteria for ed tech and curriculum products, that they were industry-wide and we promoted adoption and implementation for those developers. And we wanted to have that clarity and awareness and usefulness of the alignment claims. So 
similar to what Doc was saying when he was saying about those earlier products that knew they were intentional, but now they can be outright and say, yeah, we've had a certification that recognized that intentionality. And then we also, in effect, wanted to make sure that we were increasing the efficiency of that purchasing and acquisition process for the schools, districts, and universities. So similarly, the goals for the working group, that technical working group, we wanted to build those uh, certifications, build a rubric that could be used to do self-evaluation and then have expert evaluation. We wanted to create a process that allowed people to take that journey and honor them on that journey of learning more about UDL and bringing that intentional design into their products. And as part of that, we wanted to promote that ongoing innovation, that ongoing increased sophistication. So coming up with uh, levels that allowed to see that movement from an initial bronze certification up to gold and maybe even others in the future. We wanted to make it easy enough to get started, but rigorous enough that it was meaningful. And initially for the working group, we wanted to make sure that we had that minimum viable product concept. We didn't want to go to the nth level of detail here. Uh, we wanted to put something out into the marketplace and get feedback sooner rather than later. And Sandra, I think I'll kick it to you and you can take it from here. Yeah, so as we started to develop this certification, we looked at sort of what criteria was involved in getting a certification. And we looked at this from a number of different angles, uh, whether it was about the company itself or about the product. And we sort of honed in on, on our focus being about specific products. So we want good UDL practices within institutions organizations and institutions, but what we're certifying is a product that an educator could evaluate and decide to use in practice. And when we started that conversation, we had lots of criteria around accessibility. And as we tried to develop those out against our rubric, which is leveled uh, from level one to level five, it became very difficult for accessibility because we began to understand that we saw these as table stakes. So whether you're in the US and you're following section 508 and the ADA, I live in Ontario, Canada, where we have our own flavor, the AODA, you know, there's a lot of laws, legislations, and web standards around what it means to be a platform or a tool that is equally available to everybody. And so we considered accessibility as table stakes. So in order to get our bronze level certification, you need to comply with the WCAG level two, uh, WCAG 2.0 level AA requirements. And we see that as important to making sure that whatever you're developing is usable by the broadest number of people. Then that means, you know, it's interoperable with assistive technologies like screen readers. Uh, it's gonna play nicely across devices. And so we saw that as our table stakes going forward. So we made that a separate criteria from the rest of our criteria and just said, you know, we can help companies get there to be uh, WCAG 2.0 level AA compliant, but, but that's something that we expect of products as they come into this certification. So from there, we said, if accessibility is our table stakes, what's, what's on the table? <laughs> and we started focusing on, yes, universal everywhere, that's correct. Um, the, uh, one thing I like about that is uh, around the world, how people are aligning against W3C WCAG standards. It, it's really nice, you know, as someone who develops software that's, that's sold worldwide to see, you know, that alignment around a rigorous set of standards that, that are global. Um, so if we look at our, our, our certification, we ended up with sort of three different criteria that we would be certifying a product against to make sure it aligned with UDL. One is the capacity uh, to design and develop UDL product, pro products. So one of the things we talked about was, you know, we, we certify at a per point in time, but many products evolve over time. So we wanted to make sure that, you know, when we did this evaluation, we were evalu evaluating something that would maintain its standard over time, even if we had a, a shelf life on, a, on our uh, recertification. So that means we wanted to make sure there were good UDL knowledge and practices within the organization. Uh, criteria two, or the, or the meat of our certification is UDL within the final product. What does it look like? Uh, what's it aligning with? Is it meeting all areas of UDL? Uh, is it a solid tool for practitioners to use? 
Uh, and then criteria is its deployment in a learning environment. And by that, we mean, uh, what does it look like when it's integrated in practice at uh, a school or a school board? Um, and is it actually having the outcomes or impact it wants to have on the market? Uh, so I'm gonna go a little bit more into detail into each of these criteria, starting with the capacity to design and develop. So under this criteria, we had uh, uh, two specific points. One was around uh, staff confidence with UDL. Um, so what does it mean to be UDL? Like who needs to be certified? And as we looked at this, we talked about lots of uh, challenges. Uh, a big one here is if you know you have to prove staff competence, does that mean some sort of training program that all staff have to take? Does that mean we have a sort of pay to play type reaction where you have to take our certification in order to prove you're competent with UDL? And we wanted to avoid sort of uh, that level of you know, the idea that in order to get the certification, you have to go through a whole bunch of services, but we want to make sure that, that you know, these organizations, whether they are a small, like single person startup or a large ed tech company, are building that competence within their staff. Uh, so we've tried to write those criteria so that it supports right down to that startup and right up to that ed tech company. And then UDL integration within the development uh, of the product within the procedures and the artifacts it uh, produces. So uh, in our working group, there was a lot of focus on agile. We had a lot of people who are familiar with agile development practices. And so we talked about what does UDL look like within uh, agile development practices? What does it look like when you're writing stories and defining features that you're gonna deliver as part of the product? Um, we have had some feedback that that jargon maybe doesn't match educators, so we'll, have to look at as we move forward, how to explain that, that that process of aligning with development practices in a way that's also friendly to educators so they can understand the process that uh, tech companies go through and, and how that aligns to a great UDL product. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. So the, the, the meat of the certification is around uh, UDL within the final product. And by that mean, does it align with all the principles of UDL? Does it represent, does it show multiple means of representation, multiple means of action and expression and multiple means of engagement? What does this look like? Um, and then does it identify learner var variability relevant to the learning objectives of the product? And it, does it provide ways to support that variability? Um, we had good conversations after actually we sent our rubric out for review around this area, around what about products that meet some of the criteria, but not all. So what if you're developing a very specific app that's helping with multiple means of representation, but doesn't necessarily tackle things like engagement or action and expression. And I think that Desmo example is a really good example. It's a very specific tool that's focused on providing multiple means of representation for a graph. Um, it may do other things as well, but if that's the area they wanted to certify against UDL and say, we do this one thing really well, is that an appropriate level of certification to give an organization? So that, that's one of the things we'll consider for product certification. Um, and then we had to make sure that the way we describe these criteria and evaluated them uh, handle a wide rate of, range of products. So print materials, digital materials, things like an LMS that are very technology focused and then uh, software that's very curriculum focused about uh, sort of actually providing the means for the students to learn and demonstrate competencies. So we had to make sure we were considering sort of all these variables as we were looking through this criteria. And then our third criteria that we landed on was UDL within the product deployment or within the learning environment. So what professional learning supports are given to educators who pick up this product to make sure that it's implemented successfully within schools and school boards and what evidence of the impact on learning uh, can that product provide so that they can show that, you know, not only did they uh, live a dream of aligning with UDL, they're actually showcasing how they're actually impacting schools and impacting outcomes and sharing those best practices with others. And this is the area where I get most excited about us having three levels of certification, bronze, silver, and gold, because I find it especially in this criteria, we can really promote UDL and you know, steamroll best practices so that schools are really sharing with each other and we're really moving the bar forward. Um, some of the areas where we encountered, you know, questions and challenges here is where to set that bar on evidence, you know, uh, for a small startup having, you know, a rigorous program to demonstrate evidence over time uh, can be very challenging and we don't want to, people to be sort of 
stopped before they started in getting certification because they don't think they can afford to the, the rigor of proving evidence. So that's one of the areas we talked about. Uh, sort of that burden of proof, the rigor versus cost. Um, and then we don't want uh, sort of aligning with sort of evidence-based learning outcomes and trying to showcase your alignment with previous research or something, stifling in innovation. So we want people to feel like uh, they're showing evidence, they're doing things that are aligned with what people have done in the past to have good best practices, but also they're innovating and showing new ways of applying UDL and having great outcomes. So those are some of the things we looked at as we looked at certification. I can hand this back over to Steve now, and he'll talk about how that sort of worked its way out in different levels. Yeah, thank you, Sandra. So again, we were trying to think about this in the context of ongoing improvement and that journey along that you know, design effectiveness in deploying UDL. And this, uh, this graphic here, if you haven't seen this before, is what CAS developed for their implementation. And they have those five levels going from explore, prepare, integrate, scale, and optimize. So we leverage those as key terms, operational terms for the levels of the rubric. And that was very enabling for us to think about each of the components within those criteria that Sandra was just overviewing and really use those to craft it so that each and every component had consistent language across those levels. And it made it a lot easier for us to have uh, clean conversations and, uh, and reinforce within that technical working group. Okay, but we're saying, you know, if they're really at that explore stage and then they're moving to prepare, what we said is once they get to integrate, that's when they're really demonstrating UDL in the product. And then we get to that scale and as it suggests, they've moved beyond just demonstrating in that product and now they're scaling it in the market perhaps or in their organization. And then when they get to optimize, what we were looking for was demonstrations of impact on the industry that moved beyond just their organization and or really uh, solid ways of demonstrating optimization within their organization, maybe across other teams or across other products. So it gave us a, an enabling model to demonstrate consistency and to demonstrate growth in that journey towards uh, effectiveness. So, and we'll, we'll pull the rubric up. Uh, this gives you an example uh, and we can highlight the live rubric. Actually, I'll just pull it up now because I think it'll be easier to read actually. So we did uh, you know, a little overview. We wanted to highlight the various levels as we've talked about, and we'll go into that a little bit more. Uh, we did talk about how we wanted to influence the dispositions and mindsets of the developers. Again, in, in moving through that journey, we wanted to emphasize that they're moving towards a position of external influence. And then this special note, although the UDL framework and this particular rubric does not specifically address interoperability, we did recognize that interoperability in the education setting can represent a barrier. So we wanted to hint to that, and we're actually in conversations with other organizations who are working on uh, interoperability standards and interoperability processes for schools, and perhaps may nod to some of those and put links to some of those as examples for the folks who are moving through this. The accessibility baseline, as we talked about, that's, you know, that's table stakes. And now if you look at criteria one in that capacity, you can see those levels that we talked about. This first component, staff competence, really looking at understanding, you know, the individuals in that organization and those that are responsible for building that particular product, because we wanted it to be about the product, but in that context, we wanted to have something in there that talked about the team that was building that product. So moving to a point where at the integrate level, where that level three, we kind of designated across every component as having 
met certification at the bronze level, uh, those individuals are demonstrating within design, build, and test that they have competence uh, and demonstrated capacity to generate UDL-based product. Sandra and Doc, if you guys want to kind of chime in, maybe you can highlight some of the other things that you'd like to point out about the rubric that we can share with folks. Yeah, personally, I find that point really important because, you know, working for a company that uses a continuous delivery model, we might be certifying a product, but that product is actually changing every month with uh, with minor iterations and improvements and new features. Um, and we can't expect companies to recertify every month. So you have to set a, a, a sort of a, a framework around how recertification happens, but that makes it instrumental that there's real knowledge of UDL within that team that continues to do that development and those improvements so that you make sure that rigor and standard is standards are held going forward. Yeah, one of the other things that uh, I'll explicitly point out Within the context of UDL, the three main principles of UDL, and Sandra uh, helped explain that you may have a particular product that is very focused in its intent on one, maybe two, but maybe not all three of those principles. So we held out that you could indicate in your self-evaluation and then the communication to the expert evaluators that that's not applicable in your view, but that creates that conversation between you as the developer and the expert evaluators uh, to understand, eh, does that make sense or should you really be addressing that principle? And then one of the things that we definitely would like some input and we've heard some already is the context of having a bronze certification and perhaps if it was focused on multiple means representation perhaps not engagement or action and expression, that a bronze certification designated that it was focused on that principle, but was not specifically certified for those other two principles. So that's one thing that we're uh, hopeful can be meaningful to the uh, end customers, the people at the schools who are purchasing these products. Uh, and we've heard some initial feedback that it could be, but we certainly are interested to hear more feedback from folks on this uh, webinar and in the future. And then finally, the, the last uh, criteria as Sandra had highlighted was the combination of that professional learning support. Uh, and in here, when you get to that integrate level, we're saying that the folks responsible for that product have developed some professional development uh, deployment model that allows those best practices examples for how to use that product uh, to positively impact and is ready for implementations to use. And that was a, it might seem awkward using that term implementations, but that's one thing that we went through within the conversations was it might not always be a customer you might have an organization, maybe a nonprofit organization who's bringing great products to the end users. They might not be selling them. They might not be viewing them as customers. They view them as implementation sites. So we centered on that word implementation throughout the rubric. Doc or Sandra, can you think of anything else in particular that you want to point out? I think you're muted, Doc. sound best when I sound best when I'm muted. Huh. The, uh, I think as much as anything, we are, a big goal here was transparency. Um, in part, as, as Steve mentioned, we want to provoke a conversation both within the company, the organization about the elements of UDL. We want to, there's a process that involves anticipating the kinds of variability that's relevant to the content and the learning objectives and the transparency of these are the things we're addressing these are the things we're leaving to other devices or mechanisms that can be connected to our product and these are the things that we're leaving on the table 
um, that we hope we will address at another time or be able to get to. Uh, it's, it's, there's a, a big world of variability out there and we want to have people uh, promote an awareness of that and have processes for dealing with that in, in an ongoing way, rewarding going back and continuing to improve a product and to build that transparency into the, for the customer as well. These are the things that this product is addressing. These are the things that are left uh, not quite done yet. Yeah. Yeah, so you know it, the rubric's deep enough that obviously we can't go into detail on each component and we wanna get to the uh, Q and A and maybe we can dig deeper into aspects that folks find particularly interesting that have questions about. But I think you can see from that explore to optimize you know, that we've tried, as we said, as best as possible for each of the components to achieve the bronze level certification, you have to achieve that integrate level. And then as we'll illustrate, uh, let's see if I jump back. Within here, what we said was at that bronze level, right? That level three or higher on all components. And then to move to the silver level, you've got to have at least a majority, a simple majority at level four. You have to have everything from the bronze level. In other words, there can't be anything below level three, but you have to have a simple majority at level four. And then correspondingly for gold, you have to have a majority at level five up to that optimized level. But you must have, again, uh, achieve bronze and make sure that you don't have anything that's below level three. So we, we, we had to start somewhere. And uh, I was thinking about this slide last night. I was in a music room in a middle school and on the wall they had a sign that said, good is the enemy of great. Uh, which makes sense in a music room because you want to keep getting better. You don't want to be satisfied. And we're not satisfied with an MVP, a minimal viable product, but we know that getting something out there is the best way to help make it better. And so we're hopeful that what we have, and we're, we're really excited about getting feedback about getting, uh, having a starting point that can generate a conversation and get feedback to help us move toward perfection, but we know we're not gonna get perfection on the first try. And so this is really part of an iterative process. And so now it's just, you know, how do we get it out there? Um, we want to, you know, a big question is, does anybody care? Uh, that it does a UDL stamp mean anything beyond the UDL community? How do we get it out there to have it have value, to be able to promote principles that we think are really important for addressing the needs of so many students? Um, where do we get that feedback? Uh, We've brainstormed ideas, but we are really open to hearing from you about where we can make improvements, how do we get it out there, where should we be testing the waters, where should we be gathering feedback, and what can we be making better? Yeah, so in that context, uh, so I'm probably gonna stop sharing my screen now, so I can even interact within the, because I when I'm sharing my screen, I can't actually see the, the chat section. So I'm going to hopefully stop sharing. That's not where I wanted to be. <laughs> That's good, Steve. Yep. Then we can have more of a conversation. That's fine. Hmm. For some reason, it's not letting me stop sharing. There we go. There we go. There we go. All right, are we ready for some questions then, you think, from the audience? Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's go to uh, Brian. I think Brian has been uh, watching the Twitter feed and might have some questions, and then we'll go to Corinne next. Uh, yeah, so um, it was very hard to stay focused on both the Twitter feed and the uh, the, the YouTube live feed. 
um, because this is this is fascinating and, and there's so much depth of thought that you guys have put into this and developing this uh, and being being a classroom practitioner like this this really blows my mind and makes me very excited um, but <clears throat> but that's I could ask a million questions but um, uh, some of the questions that were coming in one of the big ones was um, and you kind of alluded to this at the end here but how can educators offer input into what makes a, a a product, quote unquote, UDL or UDL infused? Um, and are there plans? What are the plans to get the feedback? How do they get in? How do they do it? So I'll, I'll answer first and then certainly love to hear from both Sandra and Doc. I think one of the things that we recognize is, as we said in the beginning, what we blended in that technical working group. We had a couple of the folks that were on the practitioner side, one from a school uh, near the Boston area and, and a gentleman who's a head of technology and, and purchasing products uh, for a school in Indiana. And, and both of them were instrumental in keeping that voice. Uh, so despite that great influence during that formation time frame, one of the things we would love is, you know, we can provide uh, the link to the rubric and have people even look through the rubric and provide feedback. Uh, I think as far as getting feedback to us. Uh, so I probably should have had a, uh, you know, more of a meaningful, but we can certainly use the, uh, the IRN email. We can use info uh, at UDL-IRN. And uh, I guess I can just even post that in here in the chat, right? So we can go ahead and use And then I'll go ahead and I'll post the link to the uh, to the rubric as well, so that folks can have that to sift through. Uh, but that's one way that we're looking for feedback: people just reviewing through it, and then reflecting on, you know, if people are meeting level three on each of those, if they achieve a bronze level certification, is that meaningful enough to those folks at the school that, yeah, if someone does that, I think. I think I'd be happy. Doc, Sandra? Yeah, I would definitely hope once they people sort of evaluate the rubric, I hope they'd be happy with that level three criteria, that that, that bronze certification, because I think it represents good knowledge of UDL and a, a good effort and, and practice and in incorporating it in a product. Obviously, we hope that, you know, people are following these these the software that makes it to level four and level five so they can see what other schools are doing. So when they start to see that evidence of this being used in practice and, and how it was implemented, best practices for implementations that you can see how to really level set or, or, or jump ahead with your practices to really have a maximum impact. We want that sharing and learning to happen, right? We don't want this to just be about certification. We want this to be about you know promoting UDL and really building best practices around the world. It's a, I, I like the comment in here uh, from uh, Danny Smith that ADA is currently something that's sort of on a checklist and can this be on a checklist? It's a little uh, given that there are, we're talking about three levels and potentially three dimensions of three levels. It starts to get a little complicated if a product is bronze for representation and gold for something else and for another uh, one of the um, elements here. So, but it'd be nice to have it embedded that way that it is something that people are noticing if it's not. Yeah, and, I, and the other comment I'd like to say about the, you know, the ADA, one of the, one of the exciting things that's happened is kind of, a, kind of a recent rallying around that international WCAG 2.0 uh, AA and the updates around what's been done with the uh, refresh for the 508, such that they are now referencing as the benchmark WCAG AA. So there's a little more consistency. And, and although we said we're not going to get into the accessibility certification, because we think out in the industry, there's a lot of great reference points we did want to specifically, as that accessibility baseline, say that that's table stakes. If you don't have that, you're not entering the, the, the game. 
That's great. I think that um, being you guys being so open, one of the things that really struck me was was the comment uh, that that Doc you made and that everybody's uh, comments kind of reiterated the idea of transparency for both developers and and for users and users and for the product um, and and you sharing that link within the chat and um, people being able to go to that. I think it really, really um, highlights that and, and strengthens that idea that, that we're developing this, certi you guys are developing this certification with that transparency intentionally designed into it. And that will, I think that will be just incredibly helpful for folks. So Corinne, do you have, do you have a question on deck? Um, yeah, yeah. First, a comment based on that that last um, conversation about um, Steve. What you had your comment just about, you know, if it's not ADA compliant, even then, where it's not even on the on the table, that there are those those kind of minimum level um, and uh, that that I mean that entry level. I mean, it kind of look um, makes you think about it as the framework too. You know, you have your entry level. Um, you know, the ground level of the framework is really about accessibility on you know, that, that just basic accessibility. So having that as a, as a minimum standard, I think um, it's, a, it's a great reflection of, of the framework itself and where we start um, enacting that work as well. So um, and I guess another question then would be, as we're, we're talking about understanding the complexity of making things, making products um, basically accessible sometimes, that kind of, I think this was referenced in, in the slides a little bit that um, what's in it for me kind of a thing in terms of a developer from a developer standpoint, um, I think uh, in schools and um, end users of this and educators are, are um, very in favor of it. Um, how do we talk to developers and, and um, express the, the what, what's in it for them kind of a thing? Yeah. From my perspective, I, I was made aware of UDL back in roughly 2001, 2002. Uh, my appreciation for it just continued to grow because I saw a, a very nice outline framework for developers to understand great design principles. You know, it, it, on its face, it, it is just amazing design principles. And having an understanding of that. So intrinsically is gonna make you better at building products, even if you're not putting a UDL label on it. Uh, but one thing extrinsically that may uh, help is at least in the States, there's within the, uh, the recent ESSA refresh, uh, states were given the opportunity within ESSA because UDL was written into uh, that within, I think, about seven different places. There was over, I don't remember the exact number, but somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 24 states that actually wrote ESSA into their implementation plans. Uh, one state in particular in New Hampshire actually called out the context of uh, UDL certification. And then uh, Texas, in some of their pending legislation, is actually looking at uh, UDL as part of teacher certification. So it seems to, even though it still is pretty, uh, it's not very well known in the market still, it's gaining a lot of momentum. And I think from the product developer standpoint, it'll be the type of thing where you can get in front of this and have that mark of status of approval with that certification that allows you a leg up with the schools who are interested in buying student-centered, well-designed products. Yeah, and if I can jump in, just an incredible way to a credible way to do that. So, as someone who works with edtech as at an edtech company, you know, it's one thing to say in your marketing materials and your promotional work that, that you align with UDL. Um, educators say, "What does that mean?" Uh, for accessibility, we can aligned to a Section 508 VPAT or a WCAG checklist that shows actually how we meet the different criteria. And if that's available to ed tech companies to show that alignment against a rubric and criteria that is supported and promoted by the industry, then we have a language that we can talk with with educators to show that we're actually in practice doing what we say we're doing with our products. Now, one of the inspirations for this was uh, lead certification for in, environmental. And so if, if 
customers choose which hotel based in part on its LEED certification and how certified it is. And there's um, whether they're doing, you know, for whatever reason that they're doing that, there's a hope that the, there's a similar kind of push here where if people are choosing products because they're UDL certified, that puts pressures on other products to be certified as well. And then to say they're more certified, we're, we're gold. And, and in the Leeds world, there was actually push from certain hotel chains to want another level so that they could be above everybody else yet again. That'd be fabulous. Let's be more universally designed. But it is a, a, there's a demand side that has to drive this. So we really are hoping to inform educators so that they put pressure and that publishers use this as a way to help distinguish themselves from their competitors. No, I um, I think that's a great point to, um, you know, it's that that driving that competitiveness within the market itself about wanting wanting to be able to really um, demonstrate. I said we have some um, in the chat here. Um, you know, Pamela from Chile says in um, their level one explorer and began implementation this year, and they're really proud of it. I mean, it gives you that sense of you know something that you have to stand by your work, something to show the, the, the extra effort that you've put into your products um, that, that makes them stand out from others. I think that's a great way to, to approach it with, with developers. Yeah, that's yeah. great to hear, and I'm glad it's uh, someone from Chile on, because I know uh, there were a couple of, the CEO and, and the leader of the professional learning group out of CAST were just down in Chile working with them. And uh, I, from my understanding, uh, Chile has made a strong position uh, influencing the schools to implement universal design for learning. So I would imagine in that atmosphere, there's a great opportunity for product developers looking to, to uh, you know, have a leg up because of that alignment certification. Oh, Steve, uh, Pamela is always on Network and Learn. She's a, she's a regular. So uh, she's, she's been with us. Uh, we, we, we might as well put her on a panel. Wonderful. <laughs> so, hey, what's up, Pamela? Is, coming to the, is Pamela coming to the summit in uh, April? We should we should make sure that she's uh, traveling from Chile up to sunny Orlando. Yeah, or or does she want to host a host the summit? I, I'd I'd love to go to Chile. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got another another set of questions here. Um, uh, and and they're from the practical side as well. Um, so some people out there are wondering. You know, is there anybody at a bronze or silver level right now? If they were to be, if you were to evaluate it right now, if you were to look at the product, they would run through the rubric. You think that there are, uh, you mentioned some, but are there other products that you're saying, yeah, I could see that. I could see them at a bronze level. I could see them at a, at a silver level. And, and I don't want you to, you know, have to do a spot for them. Um, but could you maybe give, make, a, make a suggestion for us to check it out? That's a good question. Uh, I'm not, because I'm running through the products in my head that we've worked with Cast on that they've reviewed. And it, I'm not sure, I'm not sure they'd get uh, bronze across the board or silver, um, but that's kind of good. I mean, it's, and this is part of the, when you have criteria, you kind of know where you're lacking. That's part of the transparency. And it's like, oh man, we, if we did just a little bit more over here, we'd maybe move up a level. Uh, or if they had done a little bit more there. That's a great question. That is a great question. I saw just today, uh, there was a, a product that came through and you know, kind of the Google alerts that I have out on universal design for learning. Uh, I apologize, I don't remember. I think it started with a Z. Uh, but they talked about basing their design on universal design for learning. And they were a nonprofit organization. I think they were funded by a uh, new profit and they were just uh, announcing this math-based product. And then uh, shortly before that, there was one, uh, there was an incubator that has been, uh, Oh, I, I think we talked about this doc because I think you did some XPRIZE evaluation and there was one of the 15 finalists for XPRIZE that uh, specifically mentioned the UDL basis of their design. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's de there's definitely work. You know, it just be it would be certainly had I had products in mind as we were working on the on the rubrics. Uh, yeah, I just wouldn't. I'm not going to make. I wouldn't call out any products yet, but um, there's some that are close. And yeah, I, I put you on the spot. I'm 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 not gonna I'm not gonna front or shy away from that. I, I put you three on the spot. To see, to see, to see if you had any, any big money ties. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, it, and it's interesting because one of the things that was really important to us, and I think it was on one of the earlier slides, uh, one of the members of our technical working group was really good at reinforcing us to make sure that we didn't have that pay to play context, that it didn't seem like, you know, to be able to to be able to get into this, you had to pay to, you know, just enter the door and, and there was this, you know, uh, this environment like that. So we wanted to make sure that people understood that within this evaluation, if you're paying for certification, that it is truly a objective certification, that it is not part of just some organization that's looking to market their opportunity and, you know, gain revenue from that certification. This, the goal for this, is to stimulate that adoption and implementation in the marketplace. And to stimulate innovation, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're, it's, we tried to leave a lot of space for people to devise creative ways to meet needs that we, yeah. we haven't seen yet. Yeah, that, that rubric, uh, and I was just able to give it a cursory glance, but the rubric is, is, is flexible, right? Like there's, there's lots of room within that and there's lots of room within each one of those categories to find that space. And then Sandra, when you're talking about like, well, some products are going to be very specific. Um, that's, that's good too. Right. Cause that's, that's that whole flexibility piece. So uh, as far as designing a rubric, it's, it's a very UDL rubric too. I like. Yeah, I see a question here uh, from Muhammad. Uh, I was going to ask you about that one too. Yeah. Stacey. So that's an excellent question. And one that we tried to focus on and, and Lynn McCormack, uh, from CAST, who was on the technical working group, was really helpful for us because she kept that constant voice saying, all right, listen, we keep kind of slipping and thinking about larger organizations. What about a single developer, you know, one person who's creating a product and they want to get that product certified? Is this for them? So we honestly believe that it is. We tried hard to make sure that there were opportunities for that individual. Now you see a lot of the words like, you know, people responsible for the product or product team. That product team could be one person, but our goal was to have it be flexible. So it could be an individual up to the largest organization that has, you know, a team working on a product. Or organizations that work with partners who have yes. particular expertise. Even it came up in some of our meetings, we wanted to be able this, this to work for districts or higher uh, education organizations that are developing their own materials. And that this can be a framework to guide them and they can say, yes, we've got silver level here for the materials we've developed internally. Yeah. Sue, so I saw your note. There's one thing I wanted to add on and it's kind of tying off of what Brian had just mentioned. When, at least for me, I can't speak directly for Doc and Sandra, but when we were going through this, we were thinking about more of the quote unquote, or I was thinking more about the traditional uh, product developers, stuff that got into, say, the students' hands, the learners' hands. And then I had a chance to review this rubric with an organization that focuses on professional learning for districts. And when they took a look at it, they said, well, we produce curriculum, our professional learning curriculum you know, is not technically any different than the curriculum get, that makes it to the learners. So, you know, even though it's focused on helping to train and educate the professionals, the educators, it is still a curriculum. And they looked through the rubric and they loved it. They were saying, I can see this being a huge enabler for us to increase our practice and the way that we design our professional learning.
All right, so we are um, at almost at the end of our time for this evening. So we'll take any final comments from uh, Steve, Doc, or Sandra, if you want to share any parting words before we kind of wrap up with some uh, UDL IRN business and information about what's happening next in our little UDL sphere. So anyone want to make a final comment? Please look, let us know. We want the feedback. Yeah, is it useful? Tell us how to improve it. Tell us how to make it something that is really going to enable educators. Yeah, absolutely. And in the context of what Doc was sharing and Brian mentioned, we are trying as best as possible to have this be a transparent and inclusive process. So uh, we welcome any of the feedback that comes, good, bad, or indifferent. So please do share it. And so you need me to share my screen back and go back to yeah, the Yeah, I sure do. But I just want to just sum up by saying that I, I think that um, watching the Twitter feed and watching the chat in the, in the panel, um, from the panel, this is such a wonderful topic that I, I think it really is going to have a significant impact on educators because all the times that I've worked with um, educators and said, you know, this is really the direction we need to move. We need to make sure that our materials are accessible to all the kids. They're always saying to me, yeah, but why don't they come to us that way? So I, I think it's a perfect marriage of, you know, we've got teachers now who are interested in making sure all their kids are engaged in learning. And now we've got this opportunity for our ed tech folks to help support that. <coughs> Pardon me, I think it's a, um, it's just exactly where we need to be now that we're in this era of one-to-one -one education where kids have access to devices and we've got the tools. It's now it's time to really bring this together to support all of our learners. So I, I, I think it's a, a perfect time for this to launch and I'm excited to see the outcome uh, from both the perspective of the new tools that come at us and the implementation from educators. So just a real exciting time to be, to be an educator. Yeah, that's, that's a great wrap up, Sue. I appreciate that. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and you can Thank you. talk us through these last few. All right. So just some things that we want to make sure that our audience is aware of. In case you are free, next Monday and Tuesday, we have our first UDL IRN regional event. It happens to be in the Great Lakes area in Michigan. Um, it is from 8.30 to 3.30, both Monday and Tuesday, October 23rd and 24th. We have some excellent presenters coming out. Um, we have Jody, Joni Denger from um, Bartholomew Schools, uh, Stephanie Craig from the University of Kentucky, and also Bill McGrath from the Hyatt Group, <coughs> pardon me, coming out to present. It's going to be a great two days. Day one is a lot of learning. Day two is a lot of elbow to elbow planning with your uh, UDL team. So if you can make it, you can uh, register at udlirn.org slash Great Lakes. Love to see you out there. Also a reminder that we have our UDL IRN Summit 2018 scheduled for April 25th through 27th. Once again, we're going to be in Florida. This year we'll be at the Double Tree. So um, the registration is open. Get online and get uh, registered, udlirn.org. Love to see you out there. It's our fifth event. Uh, each event keeps getting more and more spectacular. Uh, just so much fun to hear all the great things that are planned for this year. We have an interactive learning village where uh, all kinds of um, maybe I shouldn't say shenanigans, but it's probably gonna be shenanigans are going to be uh, uh, in view and all focused on UDL and learning. So um, save that date, get registered, join us. It's gonna be a lot of fun, a lot of learning. And just a reminder that UDL chat happens every first and third Wednesday of the month at uh, hashtag UDL chat. Uh, it's a great way to connect with other UDL educators who are interested in uh, gaining knowledge, sharing knowledge, moving to that next step of UDL implementation. A wonderful way to find out new resources and hear from other educators about their progress in the UDL framework. Hey Sue, is there a particular time on those Wednesdays that that is kind of more focused? <laughs> yes, it's nine o'clock that the chat starts. Nine o'clock Eastern? Nine o'clock Eastern time. Yep, okay. thank you. Thanks for that, Steve. 
And then finally, just thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Doc, Dr. Doc Docterman and Sandra Earl and Steve Nordmark for your uh, guidance, uh, your brilliant presentation tonight. And of course, all the work that you did and to prepare for it, as, uh, including putting together the CCI credentials for uh, EdTech developers. Also, thank you to our, ho our um, uh, facilitators, Brian Dean and Corinne Hauer, for uh, fielding questions and sharing them with our panel. We appreciate all your dedication to this work. And thank you to those who have attended tonight. Uh, we appreciate your attention and look forward to seeing you next month in our next Network and Learn. So. Thank you all and thanks again for have a, have a great night.